people always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Isley. I like everything about him. All right. On today's episode, we have Joe Rawlinson who has the Dad's Guide to Twins podcast. I was on his podcast a couple weeks ago. It's coming out soon. And we had such a good time talking about my twins. I said, man, we got to get you on my podcast because I want to hear all kinds. I know you have a ton of stories about all these twins. Uh, Everybody, it's Joe Rollinson. What's up, buddy? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, thanks for coming on. So first of all, you got to tell everybody about your twins. How old are your twins now? My girls, I have identical twin girls, and they are almost 15. They'll be 15 this summer. Um, they are most eager to learn how to drive a car, which I haven't figured out how I'm going to handle twin driver's ed. That scares, that scares me, as does twin increasing of car insurance, but we'll sort all that out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, we got you to learn on. Yeah. Tell us what else we have in store that we need to save up for now. The, um, yeah, so it's been 15 years. I've got two older boys too. Um, my oldest uh, just turned 18 and I've got a 16 going on 17 year old boy. They're all in high school. So I've got freshmen, my girls are freshmen, I have freshmen, sophomore and junior. So it's all the activities all the time right now. All my kids have part-time jobs. So we're shuttling, if we're not shuttling them to like track or a drama musical thing, we're taking them to and from work. So anyway, part oh. of me wants part of me wants everybody to be driving, and part of me is scared to have everybody driving because, yeah, um, yeah, you know that's what parents worry about. Yeah, dude, I get it. I, I get think, it. I think that's really awesome that they all have jobs though. That's that's really great. You don't hear that much anymore. Like, yeah, yeah you just don't. So I think that's great. We have teen family and friends that are our, our babysitter that is on the road with us is nineteen. She doesn't drive. She doesn't want her license. Yeah, she's taking forever to get her license. She's really dragging her feet. The adults are pushing her. Yeah, yeah, um, and we're trying to be like hinting, like, yeah, you could get your license, and you could totally drive yourself back and forth to our house instead of us having to come pick you up. Because she lives about two and a half hours away, so we have to coordinate with my parents to pick her up and drop her off when we have a break between shows. So, like, we have we have the week off this week. We have. Um, I had teach magic classes and I had a couple other smaller projects, but we didn't need to take the whole family and crew to these gigs. Right. So uh, she went home for the week, but usually she lives with us. Right. But man, get a driver's license. (laughs) She's got a job. She works with us, but get a driver's license. It would help. Right. It's very, it's very handy. Um, Our oldest drives and he takes, he takes the rest of the siblings to school and back. And that's just great. And um, my, like I said, my twin girls are really excited to learn how to drive my, my second born he's dragging his feet kind of like you're describing with your babysitter of getting that license so we'll see how it all plays out um but natalie you mentioned uh teenagers having jobs is not as frequent as it used to be i mean i had a job as a teenager and right as did my wife and we realized uh, you learn a lot of life skills in that kind of situation that you're not going to learn at home and you're not going to learn at school and so Plus, you get the benefit of you're making some money that they can put away for college or, or their future. Right. Um, so we were all about, hey, let's let's uh, encourage them to get a job. We would we were open and honest about what my wife and I did when we were kids, and we kind of pushed our kids in to get a job somewhere close to where we live, so we didn't have to drive them too far. Um, but it's it's and and they were initially very hesitant. Of course, they were I mean scared to death to go in and talk to some manager to, to apply for a job. But the reality is all these places are so hungry for employees that they'll, they'll just snag them up. Right. So my oldest has been at the same place for two or three years now. It's like a, it's like a bowling alley game center kind of place. He really enjoys that. And uh, my other three kids, the twins and my other son are at Chick-fil-A. So they, they've had a blast there. And, That's awesome. Uh, Dude, I worked at Chick-fil-A when I was, the cool thing about Chick-fil-A, I was in high school and they worked around my football schedule. I mean, I could come in at 8.30 at night. I'm only working for an hour. It was in a mall. But then you're cleaning until 2, 3 in the morning. So they just let me do. They we had like 50 people on the schedule and they only awesome. needed 20 because some people could only work two hours a day. 
Yeah. It was, it, they're really flexible, really amazing group of people. So you got three of yours working there. That's awesome. But the Bowling Alley Game Center sounds fun too. Yeah. Yeah. He likes that. I think he also likes not being at the same place as all his siblings. He wanted yeah. some independence and not being compared to each other, you know, which is, which is fine. So it's been fun to watch him mature into those jobs because they have to coordinate with their scheduler and the manager and, you know, ask for time off and get along with a whole wide range of coworkers, a whole wide range of, of customers from very pleasant to very angry people. And so those are, you know, life skills that'll serve them great for whatever yeah. comes in the future. So I'm curious, cause you have five, wait, you have four. six in your household. Oh, six, in six, your household. Is, yeah. Six family, four kids. Yep. <laughs> What kind of calendar do you have in your house? How do you set that up? Because you need to know everybody's dentist schedule and doctor schedule and work schedules and drama schedules. How do you make that all work? Okay, so everyone has a Google account, has a Gmail. And so each of the kids has their own calendar. And then we've got like a family calendar. So everybody shares all those together. So everybody can see everybody's calendars on their, in their, on their phone or in the Google calendar app. And so if they are working, they'll put the work schedule on. Um, if they have, you know, some activity with friends or they're going somewhere, they'll put that on the calendar. Or if they have like extracurriculars, like a track meet or uh, a musical rehearsals and stuff like that, they'll put that on the calendar. So then every Sunday, you know, around dinner time on Sunday, we'll just go through the calendar really fast with everybody to make sure we know what's going on for the week. We know where everybody needs to be. If there's conflicts, we're, you know, maybe my wife may have to be in one spot and I may have to be in another spot. We can coordinate all that. Now, you, usually it's mostly just for my wife and I to make sure everything can happen because the kids kind of probably forget until the day of whatever the event is, which is why we force them to put it on the calendar. But so that's worked yeah, pretty that's, well. That's good. You were texting yeah. your mom. Why does your mom get on the Google calendar so she can, the babysitter, we have to but let you, the babysitter know every show that we have so uh, they know that that she is going to be with us that week or that time period yeah. or no reason calling because we're on the road or at, at a show teach her that you, you don't think she it. can do google calendar i'll let you teach her all you have to do is open the app i will let you teach her oh that's if the problem i just <laughs> so she booked two shows today and they're illusion shows and she's got to put it on our calendar she's got to put it on the google calendar she's got to make the contracts and then she's got to text her mom and then she's got to tell the publicist, but the publicist knows because of the Google calendar. Right. Let your mom have our Google calendar. Does she have to have a Gmail account to have access to the Google calendar? Yeah. I mean, that's okay. what we've, we had yeah. to do. She doesn't have Gmail? She doesn't have Gmail. Well, it's free to set to, one up. We have to set her up a Gmail. Set one up for Willow. Anyway, that's anyway. True. So let's tell me. So you interviewed me for the, it was the Dad's Guide to Twins podcast. And I'm mm -hmm. like, this is great. This would be fun. I had fun with you. It was a great experience, but I was a little nervous getting into it because anytime people ask me questions about my twins, I defer to my wife, <laughs> right? I'm a dad, right? I'm there for the kids. Am I a good dad? Yes. Okay. Yes. But I don't know all the birth weights and all the facts and questions people are going to ask me. And I was afraid I was going to get questions like that. I didn't. We had a great time, but I said, man, we got to get you on our podcast because I know you guys can banter back and forth. And then you were like, man, your childbirth was easy. There was no yeah. NICU time. There was no anything. We what, were was, in that way. what was your experience like? Did you guys end up with a NICU time? Now it's time for us to interview you and hear some stories about your podcast and your crazy experiences with the whole twin thing. Our, our pregnancy and the birth went pretty smoothly, actually. Um, so maybe maybe a little similar to yours where my wife, the, the pregnancy was fine. She did get put on some kind of partial bed rest. Uh, cause she was having some preterm labor, mm -hmm. but that was mostly just, um, she had to kind of lay down for two or three hours a day. It wasn't totally restrictive bed rest where she was in the actual bed all day or in the hospital, which, you know, lots of moms have to go through. So, um, the challenges there was we had two very young toddlers at the time, not even two, not even three. Um, and so they of course were very active and running all over the place while mom's trying to rest. So we had to get creative with schedule that way. We would, we hired, like, there was a teenager who lived across the street, a high school girl. So we would, we hired her to come over and just play with the boys in the late afternoon. So my wife could just, you know, sit on the couch or, or rest. And then um, of course, and then I would, I would come home shortly after that and can help out from work. So 
aside from that, there weren't any complications with the pregnancy. Uh, we got to about um, 36 weeks of the pregnancy and we were having every, every weekly checkups with a doctor. And by this point, as you know, Natalie, like uh, mom was extremely uncomfortable and massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, compared to just a single baby, uh, everything was just miserable for her. So uh, she was ready for those babies to come. And so we went to this regular checkup and she's trying to like convince the doctor to like, let's have the babies today. And the doctor's like, well, you're only 36 weeks. She tried to wait, wait a little bit more. Um, but then they hooked my wife up to uh, a monitor to see what was going on with her, with the baby's heartbeats and if there's any contractions going on. Turns out she was having contractions. So uh, just the early stages of of that. So the doctor's like, okay, well, you want to have babies today? Great. Let's have babies today. So what was like a, a morning doctor's appointment uh, where I left, I left work. I went to the, the, the doctor's appointment with my wife. I thought, okay, I'll just go back to work after this. Yeah. I didn't go back to work. I was just yeah. from, from doctor's office to the hospital and to the um, labor and delivery ward. We had to wait because uh, there were lots of mothers who were farther along in labor than my wife. Yeah. And we knew that we were going to be having a C-section uh, with our girls because uh, one of the girls was transverse. So she was kind of laying side to side. Okay. Um, and we'd had C-sections with each of our two boys before, so we kind of knew what the routine was going to be. Our first our first son, we were hoping for a natural birth. He got stuck, so we had to do emergency C-section. That was not not the ideal situation. Second son, we knew we were going to have a C-section. We planned it. We showed up a certain time, had the baby. So with the twins, um, we knew it was going to be C-section. We knew what to expect. Um, so like we, so the doctor's appointment was in the morning, let's say 10. So maybe five or six at night, we find they're getting prepped for operating room. They take my wife in and I'm pacing the halls waiting. Um, you think they just kind of forget you because there's nobody in the halls. The lights are low. You're like, did they lose me? Am I, am I going to be invited in to actually see my girls be born? Yeah. So they rush, they rush me in. I'm in my scrubs, you know, the, the twins are born. Uh, no problem with, with delivery. I was, I wanted to really see them be born but the doctor and the crew are like we don't want dads to pass out on the floor when they see all the blood so you stand up dad when we tell you to stand up and you can see when we tell you to see um okay. so i was you know just chilling at the at the head of the table with my wife's head and the anesthesiologist was right behind us but the girls were born healthy um i got to see them right away you know you're counting all the fingers and toes make sure everything's in order it was. And then I realized, oh, there's another one still coming. So I rushed back. I, I didn't know, should I like tell my wife what's going on? Should I pay attention to the baby A? Should I rush back to see baby B be born? It was kind of a little crazy. Yeah. Um, but they were both born fine and uh, we got them swaddled up, got to show them to mom. And then uh, they whisked them away. They had, they didn't have any complications. They didn't have to go to the NICU. It was just kind of, let's get them cleaned up and ready to go while they well, the doctor sewed my wife back up and got her through her post-op. Um, so we were at the hospital three or four days uh, just for her recovery from the, it was more the recovery from the C-section than it was the babies because the girls, the girls were fine. Right. And then it's like, okay, good luck. Go home and hope it works out. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah. When you get sent <laughs> home, it's, it's, we were ready to go. I, I think I told you the wrong time. Ready. I did tell you the wrong time on your podcast because dad math. I think I said like 40 hours we were out of there, but it was 30 hours and we were out of the hospital. Yeah. We and they were like, you long. can stay another day. And we're like, we don't want to. All wanna the stay. nurse, yeah. All the nurses were like, you have twins. You should stay. And I was like, I want to go home. I, I want to go home. And my doctor was totally fine with it, but the nurses were like, acting like I was crazy for going home early but I was like I, everybody's fine I'm fine the babies are fine I want to go home I you can't sleep in hospital you know not that you're going to get much sleep with newborn twins but you're going to get a little bit more without people walking in and out and checking babe because I mean what you think they could coordinate it check mom check each baby but no, it's like they got to come in and check mom and then they got to leave for 15 minutes and come back and check one baby and leave and come back and check. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, I was happy to go home early. You so. were talking about your wife having bed rest. You didn't have bed rest. No, but I also was pregnant in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't have our normal schedule, obviously, of doing shows every single day, gone all the time. I think 
that was God really watching out for us because I think if we had our normal schedule, I probably would have been put on bed rest because I would be doing too much. So um, <clears throat> I think that helped. But yeah, we have very similar stories. I just, I didn't have a C-section. I had my natural, um, which I was thankful for because mostly I'm just scared of getting that needle in my back. That's pretty much the reason I wanted to do all natural. But I made it to 37 weeks exactly. So I made it one week longer than your wife and everything went smoothly. Um, it was completely different from Lana's birth because we were able to stay in the birthing room and the lights were down low and everyone was real quiet. And it was just the doctor and like one or two nurses and my husband. And it was all just, it was like peaceful. You have twins and they don't care whether it's C-section or natural. You're in the operating room because there's a bigger chance of something happening. And it's bright lights and it's like five nurses and two doctors and an anesthesiologist just in case. But um, yeah, so completely different experiences, but they both worked out great. So, yeah. How much did yours weigh? Do you know the numbers? Bad? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know our numbers either. Julian was five, seven and Lex was six pounds, 12. Okay. I had nice, big, healthy twin babies. Yeah. <laughs> that's not normal. Yeah. That's so. pretty big. Right. Exactly. But yeah. I remember cause we were homeschooling <laughs> our 11 year old and she would come downstairs and just set, all she would do is walk down the steps, uh, make herself a cup of coffee, hot chocolate, whatever she was having go over to the desk to start teaching the kids and her foot, it looked like a balloon. Somebody yeah, had swollen ankles. her ankles and her foot. It looked painful. Yeah. And she was just trying to teach homeschool. She's putting her feet up and just reading to my daughter. But my gosh, did that look awful. Yeah, sorry. Well, you know, it happens. Yeah. But yeah, you get to the end of that pregnancy and you're right. You're miserable. You are miserable and so tired. And um, yeah, I remember Lana would my daughter would have to read to me as part of school and I would be sitting there holding the book and I would just be dozing off. Like <laughs> just because, I mean, I'm out to here and I'm ready to have babies and I'm, I mean, I'm just falling asleep while she's reading to me. I, was, I felt so bad, but yeah. So when I got off the air with you, one of the last things you said to me was, you know, no NICU time. No, what are some crazy NICU stories you've heard? I mean, it's gotta be weeks and months in the NICU. Oh Yeah. Yeah, the, it's like the whole breadth, like from, let's say, fairly normal delivery pregnancy, like like we're talking about your your family and mine, and then uh, three or four months in the NICU, uh, requiring, because these babies can be born like mid-20 weeks of the pregnancy, and so they may have some major complications that require all kinds of surgeries to get them ready uh, for the real world, or they just may be so small that they just need time to grow, you know, keep developing and growing in the hospital so they can actually eat themselves and breathe by themselves and, and stuff like that. Um, like even the, even our, our pregnancy was pretty uneventful. And I realized talking to, I've, I've interviewed probably about a hundred dads, hundred twin dads now. And some of them had some pretty, you know, scary times during that pregnancy where the doctor's like, well, you know, one of your twins may make it, but the other twin may not make it. Or or you may be losing your twins or your twins have this very serious condition where there's, there's something called uh, twin to twin transfusion syndrome, where basically one twin is uh, gobbles up all the fluids and nutrients and kind of starves out the second twin. Right. And so that's bad for both twins because one is getting too much and one is getting too little. I talked to one dad, they had to go, you know, travel across the country and get like a special laser surgery because the placenta for their twins was shared and that was causing this, this t uh, twin to twin transfusion problem. So they had to like, there's a surgery where they can laser separate this placenta so that there's wow. no more sharing of that between the twins. Wow. Um, so first of all, that that's even possible is just amazing, right? Like they can go yeah. in during the pregnancy, perform this procedure and save the lives of the twins, you know, through this. It's just, it's a miracle. So, I wouldn't know where to start with that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That would be very scary. What kind of, Twin, I know you said identical, but like ours are identical, but they're die die, which isn't normal for them to be identical. So we had um, like the safest, I think, is what they, the least amount of complications because they had separate sacks, separate placentas. What what were yours? What were your girls? Uh, we had Modi twins. Okay. Um, so a little higher. Yeah, I don't know. I only know die die now. 
So they shared a placenta, but they had their own sacs. Is okay. um, so there was there's there was the risk of the same serious thing, thing I just described to you, the twin to twin transfusion. Um, but that never was a problem. One of our girls was a little bigger than her sister, but nothing that required any kind of intervention medically. So out of a hundred people, um, we found out five months in. How common is that on your podcast? People finding out that so late. That's really time? that's really rare to find yeah. out that late. <laughs> yeah. That's really rare. Usually it's um well, it depends on how, I guess it depends on how the twins came about. Like there's a lot of uh, families I talk to where they've done some kind of uh, in vitro or medical assistance to help get pregnant. And so they're, they're usually monitored a lot more closely. And so they find out really early, seven, eight weeks um, where they're like, yeah, you're going to have twins. Um, other times uh, the family may just assume it's a regular pregnancy. You know, they get the positive test and then they go in and get a checkup and, if there's no ultrasound in that first visit or so, I mean, you may go a couple months till you find out you're going to have twins. Um, our, our story was my wife found out she's pregnant. And um, so she scheduled an appointment with a doctor to just confirm that I had been with her to the other appointments with our boys. I'm like, okay, they're just going to do blood work. You may have to pee in a cup and then do some tests. And how about I just watch the kids while you go into this checkup. And so she goes into the checkup and, well, they do more than just a standard test. They actually do an ultrasound and they discover the twins, you know, while I'm not there. Right. So she, she calls me on the phone and says, you should come pick us up. And I am like, great. Uh, Cause I've been driving around with our little boys. And I was like, well, how did it go? And she's like, well, we got an ultrasound. It went great. I was like, oh yeah. So I was ultrasound. She's like, it was great. We, we saw healthy heartbeats and everything looks great. So I'm like, oh, that's nice. That's nice. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Did you say heartbeats, uh, plural heartbeats? And she's like, yeah, we're having twins. And I'm, I don't even know how I drove from where I was to the hospital to pick her up from that appointment. But um, that's where the craziness began uh, from there. So as far as finding out, like y'all find out about five months, that's that's pretty that's pretty rare. Um, yeah. Yeah, but we were together. We yeah. were right there in that moment together. I, I am very glad you were with me. I was in so much shock. I, I don't, I, yeah. We just, I started laughing because I didn't know what to do. It was either laugh or cry because she was like, and she had this dumbfounded look at her face oh, and her yeah. jaw dropped and I'll, we'll figure it out, I guess. Yeah. But I was just laughing and she said, why are you laughing? It's to stop from crying. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Uh, I was just, yeah. I mean, think about it. We do 400 shows a year on the road with our family. Now, how do you take twins there? How do you take what? Right. So I already have bunny rabbits and birds and a daughter and my wife and myself and the show. And we're videotaping it for our television show. Now we have twins. How the heck is this going to work? And then me, I get, I get really like, I overthink. So I'm like, what if one of them's handicapped? Now, how do you do the handicap ramp? How do you do, how do you do a handicap loader in a van? How much does that cost? Why am I, why am I going down that road? I'm planning for the worst and hoping for the best, but it just, I didn't need to do that. That was just way too much. I was freaking out. It was just me freaking out. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, that's that's what we did. We we freaked out. We were actually, yeah. it was around around the Christmas holiday time, and we were going to get on a plane the next day to go visit her family. And we're, you know, we couldn't sleep that whole night, and we still have to get our little boys ready to go on this trip. And we're just in shell shock trying to figure out. And and like you, I was running through all the scenarios. I'm like, well, I already know how difficult these two little toddlers are that I have. How am I going to handle two? How are they going to fit in the house? Do we need a bigger house? Do we need a bigger car? How am I going to afford this with my job? It was yeah you know, all those what if scenarios, and it took a while for us to talk through all those and and plan up plan plan things out. I mean, it, it all ended up working out fine, right? But in the moment, you're thinking, "How am I even going to handle all this?" Do twins run in your family? No, they don't. And yeah. I, identical twins don't run in anybody's family. They're very they're random. So That's right, they're identical. Heard, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I forgot. So, I mean, I didn't know that at the time, you know, Right. I, I knew that, I know that now, but um, yeah, there's, there was no twins in the family and. They really so, need to tell people this. I'm, I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, there is a chance any one of y'all could have twins, you know, like I never even thought it was a possibility because like we didn't do IVF. So it was just twins don't run in the family. We don't have, it's, it's, 
we'll be fine. She's My like, kids are homeschooled. I went to you know public school. They didn't teach me that. <laughs> sex ed. My wife said, "Can we try for one more?" Sure, one more. Yes, that's what I agreed to. And it took me ye eight years to agree to one more. Yeah. No one said that you could sneak in a second one. I didn't know that was an option. I mean, that's not cool. I love yeah. them. I love them with all my heart. Now I'm over it. But at that moment, I was like, dude. And when we did our uh, gender reveal, we told everybody it wasn't IVF. It doesn't run on either side of our family. We don't, we're don't. we just as confused as you are. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night. Twins. They're coming. Yeah. They're coming. We still had another four months, but they're coming. Uh, you know, it's like. Yeah. Yeah. And we had our, our gender <clears throat> reveal scheduled for the day after we found out. And we thought it was just going to be a gender reveal. We didn't know it was going to be a oh, surprise. It's actually twins reveal. So that was that was interesting. We were both still in shock, telling everybody else and putting everybody else in shock too. <laughs> so they weren't as much shocked as we were in. No, no. So uh, one thing people don't know is how expensive everything is for twins. Yes. You know, you you get a stroller. It's 150 bucks. I'm just ballparking. But you get a double stroller. For some reason, it's five hundred dollars. <laughs> that like, makes no sense. You're getting double the stroller. I get double the price. Why triple? Why quadruple? It's crazy, right? It is. Yeah. The we we were hoping we could reuse a lot of stuff from our first two kids, um, mm -hmm. but because we were expecting, like you, like okay, well, this is gonna be the third child. We'll just use leftover crib. We'll use leftover car seat. Well, actually, you need yeah, you need two of all that stuff. So, we kind of did a hodgepodge of we're like we're not doing a brand new nursery with brand new everything, matchy matchy everything. We're just gonna take this old crib we already have. We're gonna get a new one. Same thing with car seats. Our car seats didn't match. The um, we ended up buying a a inline frame stroller that you could snap the car seats into. Mm -hmm. Um. So that worked out great. And then when they, once the kids, once the girls are old enough to hold up their heads, we just used a, like a double umbrella stroller. So we kind of avoided the super duper double travel system, $600 price package. We, we skipped all that. So um, what we didn't count for was that our toddlers were, were quite ready to move on from stroller once we had the twins. Like they still wanted or weren't capable of walking everywhere. So mm -hmm. We end up baby wearing, like we had uh, baby Bjorns. So I would carry one of the girls on my chest. My wife would carry one of the girls on her chest. And then we still had the stroller in case the boys were, our toddler boys were too wasted to walk around. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you you definitely had it. Um, yeah, we probably had Probably a little bit more difficult than us because you you, still, you had toddlers, whereas we had- A nine-year-old that could help us. Yeah, well, she was almost nine, but yeah she, yeah, she was eight when they were born. And so she could definitely, we didn't need a stroller for her, obviously. We didn't need all that stuff. Um, but the other difference is, is we had already, so we still had the crib from her, but we didn't have the car seat anymore. Um, and obviously we just had a single stroller, so we needed- be able to hold two and so we had to do that kind of thing but we did have very generous family and friends who helped us out a lot and got us the and, double stroller yeah. six hundred dollar yeah and the, and the car seats and all that jazz which was awesome um but our our boys did not like to sleep alone so while we started with two cribs where we had one and then somebody actually gave us one of one of theirs that they didn't need anymore. So that was nice. At least we didn't buy it. We tried putting them in separate cribs once they moved out of our room into cribs, but they would not sleep. So we ended up having to put them both in one crib. Did you guys, did you guys have that or were your girls able to sleep separately? Well, when we brought them home from the hospital, we actually had them in the same crib and because they were in the same kind of bassinet at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now the current recommendations are, are that they, each child has their own sleep surface for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, this was 15 years ago. So they they were in the same crib, but when they're newborns, they didn't even, you know, you swaddle them up, they don't even move. They just like, you, where you put right. them, they, they just stay there. So until they started kind of moving around and rolling around, they were in the same crib. So that was probably about three months. It took us that three months to move their older brother out of his crib to get him to like a big boy bed so we can free up his crib to have two cribs in the, in the twins nursery. So once we separated them, they were still in the same room and they were, the cribs were close enough where like my wife or I could stand between the cribs and reach and touch both babies. 
so they were kind of close enough where they could sense each other's presence and they kind of even did like i don't know like, like bats where they do echolocation where they kind of squawk and they would squawk back at each other just yeah. to make sure they were there that's oh. that's how i envisioned in my mind of what they were trying to do to, to just make sure that their sister was there that's a great description because yeah. it's not babble it's not anything it's just a noise yeah, yeah you're it, that's perfect yeah that's really cute yeah. So, so they were they were fine sleeping, uh, sleeping together in the, initially, and then when we had separated them, the more of the challenges came when they got older, and they would, you know, try to keep each other awake. So they'd want to keep talking to each other, or keep playing with each other, or throwing stuff in each other's cribs across the room, stuff like that. Or That's, one wakes up and the other one, why are you asleep? Wake up! Yeah. I'm awake. You need to be awake. Yeah. Right. So we had to get creative with some sleep training stuff or maybe we'd put one to sleep in her crib and the other girl like on our bed in our bedroom at night. And then once they were both asleep, we'd, you know, transfer the sleeping twin back to her crib or where we would stay. One of us would stay in the room. Um, Cause what, if we were just in the room with them, they would usually just kind of be still until that one of them or both of them could fall asleep. But as soon as we would leave, they would, you know, party time throwing everything around. So, um, it took a little bit of, of that where we kind of ooch our way night by night. We'd be closer and closer to the door until after, you know, a week or two, we're not in the room anymore. We just put them down and leave the room. So. Yeah. That so sounds familiar. talking, talking yeah. to you in that podcast we did together. Um, I told you that I lay in bed, put them to bed at nighttime. I have one on each arm, right? Hitting the camera, one on each yeah. arm. And. I'm sore, I'm hurt, because you sit like this for an hour and a half, and you can't move, and each one wants love, each one's holding your hand and rubbing the hairs in your arms, and until they fall asleep, well, then I have to try to get their head out from underneath of them, and then get out of the room, and you were like, no, I just sat in the corner, and just put them down, and sit in the corner, but I'm there, mm -hmm. I started doing that after our podcast, dude, I'm out in like, sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes it's 40 but it, it was like 15 minutes last night. So God bless you. Thank you. That was a great tip. I don't have this every night. I love that cuddle time. I love that cuddle. I love that. But dude, you can't do it all the time every night. It hurts. And if I got to get up at six in the morning, I don't want to be all stiff and hurting. And, and boy, you couldn't hold one and ignore the other. They wanted both at the same time when it's time to go to bed. So, yeah. Yeah. And he's leaving over there. They're both still awake, but I tired enough that they're going to sleep so he'll come to bed and i'll just i'll just read until i see that they've both settled completely down and then go to sleep which is a lot better than it used to be so yeah but they still share a, a bed we we started out with just one crib and then they got too big for that and we got a full-size mattress and one of those giant play pens to keep them contained and put the mattress in there and that worked until they completely destroyed the playpen. <laughs> so I think that would have been good just, for girls. If you had twin yeah. girls, I think it would work. But boys are just violent. Destructive. Yeah. Um, so now it's just a mattress on the floor, pretty much, because they will still roll off. And I don't want them, we don't want them falling out of bed yet. Or not yet, but you know, they gotta learn to stay in bed. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so they're doing pretty good with that for the most part. <sighs> so Oh, with the twin babel, when did that stop for you? Did they have their own language? I hear that all the time. Twins have their own language. Uh, they did. And our girls had a small complication there because they were tongue tied. Um, well, let me go back. So when, when they were, when they were babies, uh, my wife was trying to breastfeed them and they just couldn't get a good latch and combining that with our twin our toddler boys running circles around mom and distracting the babies while she's trying to breastfeed um breastfeeding was not working so we found out that their their tongues were tight so they had to do a little procedure where they snip the uh, up underneath the tongue to free that up mm -hmm. and then they were able to to feed better but i don't know if it was lingering uh fallout from that or what but our girls did have some speech impediments where they had their own way of talking where we got so used to my wife and I got used to what we could kind of understand what they were saying, but anybody outside the house was kind of baffled by what they were talking about. And we eventually had to take them to uh, do some like speech therapy for probably half a year to help work through that. Um, but they, even before they were verbal, 
they would babble and communicate with each other. I mentioned the echolocation thing when they were really little, but even when they were uh, crawling around or, or toddlers, they had, they would, they would talk to each other and you wouldn't know what they were saying. Um, later they were actually saying words and no one else would know what they were saying. You know, we, we figured it out and, but uh, fortunately we were able to get that taken care of so that like people at school or church or friends could know what they were talking about. How old were they when they started speaking? English, <laughs> not twin language. Um, they, I mean, we um, probably in that second year, they had. Okay. But we also did some baby signs with them. Uh, mm -hmm. We did we did some baby signs with our first two, um, and just like basic baby signs to help communicate their basic needs, really helped alleviate a lot of their um, inability to communicate. Like. I want more food or I'm tired or I don't want this or I need a drink of water, whatever, just basic stuff up to eliminate a lot of tears. And even though they couldn't say those words yet. So I think using baby signs helped help them through, but also maybe prolonged a little bit them wanting to actually speak some. Okay. Well, that's yeah, not good. Our, I wouldn't think about that. Yeah. Our kid, our, our boys definitely have that twin language because they use like all the language rules. One talks while the other one waits and then the other one has his time to talk and they're, it, it's completely, it's just, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I, they, but they, you can tell they understand each other. And they, they nod. Like, uh -huh. They make a plan or they say no, or you, whatever. And they make this plan and they like, go do it. And it's, it's like, well, they know exactly what they're saying. And they do say some things like milk and eat and dad and mom. And, you know, they definitely have words um, that they, they say, but I, I know our daughter was speaking a lot more at their age than what they are. Um, at their last checkup, the doctor wasn't worried about it because, you know, they respond and they listen, like you tell them to put something down and they will do it. So they know what you're saying. They're just not speaking yet. And so that's why I was curious, like how old your girls were when they actually started speaking English a little bit better. Um, our boys are two and a half and I'm still kind of, I'm just waiting for the day when something clicks and it just all of a sudden, um, they'll come out with full sentences here. So, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it varies. I mean, I've talking to lots of other twin dads and families, <laughs> every twin situation is a little different. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even your your two different children are different from each other and how they progress milestone wise. Um, so you're, I mean, if if you are concerned, it's it's good to be talking to the doctor about that. It seems like your boys, for example, can can hear and follow instructions and all that stuff is not a problem, right? So it's just right. just the verbalization, which um, yeah, it'd probably be like a dam breaking where one day they'll just start saying all the things all the time and. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Isn't right. that weird how that that's, works? That's what I'm thinking. And, and I'm not too worried about it. I'm just kind of like wishing, especially when they're having breakdowns, like I wish they would have the words to say what is wrong, you know, so that I could help them. Like my belly hurts or I'm just, you know. <laughs> my brother bit me. Right. <laughs> they're just screaming and running across the room. <laughs> right. We don't know what's wrong with them. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, English would help, but you know, I figure I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I, I figure it's going to happen when it happens. I know that they understand us when we're speaking to them. So I that really, I mean, if they didn't, then I would be concerned, but the fact that they do understand, yeah, it makes me not too concerned. Well, you had mentioned, uh, you weren't going to do the matchy thing when they were infants, just money and just everything else. Did you ever get into the matchy thing with little girls? My wife Clothes. would have been crazy with that, with the matching hair bows and the dresses and things. And I, when I was pregnant, I was telling everybody, I'm not doing the matchy matchy thing. Cause we weren't sure if they were going to be identical or fraternal because we had dye dye. So we assumed they were going to be fraternal. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to do the matchy matchy. That's just over the top. And then I had them and I put them in matching outfits and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so cute. And so like I have them matching all the time when they leave the house now. So did you guys do that? <laughs> um on special occasions we get them matched up. Uh I was really worried like I would get them mixed up. Like uh, like are you really baby A? Are you really baby B? Mm -hmm. And so we kind of devised this scheme where we would dress one of the girls in a certain set of colors. And the, her sister in a different set of colors. So one girl had like warm colors, like orange, yellow, reds, pinks. 
the other girl had cooler colors like greens, blues, purples, stuff like that. And then that made it easy for, I mean, we, I was worried about mixing them up, but we could tell them apart. Mm-hmm. With the color pattern, that was easy to explain to anybody, you know, family, friends, whomever was coming over, so they could tell who was who. And the bonus benefit was looking back at pictures when they were really little. You're like, oh, I know who that is. I know who that is because I can tell what they were wearing. So eventually they start to have an opinion about what they wear. And so that pattern kind of got thrown out the window. So then we went to like hairstyles, different hairstyles. So one of our girls had bangs and the other one did not. And so that was the pattern we could teach everybody outside the house how to tell them apart. One has the bangs, one does not. Um so that worked like it. So we um, would dress them identically, you know, on special events or holidays and stuff like that. Uh, but most of the time they were wearing maybe um, the same style of outfit, just the different color shades. So um, it worked out okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have, I mean, one has thicker hair, one has thinner hair, but the same hair color and same everything. And we can tell them apart. And- we don't we don't care if other people can i guess yeah yeah. and we have messed up on photos we have baby photos where we argue no that's that one no that's that one and my daughter thinks she knows and sometimes she's on my team and sometimes she's on my wife's team yeah but that's only a few photos for most of them we can figure it out unless they have like a hat on or something but yeah with die die twins they say that even if they're identical there's always something that's going to be a little different like the hair is going to be which is the case for ours one is thicker one is thinner um one's like one's a, pound a, heavier. One's a little bit heavier than the other one but we could totally tell the difference between them but we have people that come over and they're just like okay which one's which and, and so you have to let them know um but closer family has now gotten used to and i'd say 90 percent of the time can tell which one is which so so when you were saying they're matchy just for holidays and things okay that's taking them up to you know 10 years old do they want to dress alike ever? Now. now, now, as teenagers, it would be to try to trick other people, like a parent trap situation where yeah. um, they, <laughs> they they would, like one time they went to work, I mentioned they work at Chick-fil-A, so they have the same uniforms. They switched name tags just to see how long it would take their coworkers to realize you're not the right person. So they thought that was hilarious. Um, um, Did it work? It worked? Um, it did, although they were worried about like getting in trouble. So it, they didn't do the whole shift at work. It was like, okay, joke's over. Let's go back. Give me my name tag back. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, did, does anybody know? Like the people, like. Uh, did they figure it out? I guess is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, or let them on. Did they ever let them on? I think they did. Cause they thought it was so, my girls thought it was so funny that they couldn't help but spill the beans and tell everybody okay. what a fun, oh. fun joke it was. Gotcha. Um but one of my girls, she she got her ears pierced several years ago. She wanted to do that, and her sister doesn't want to do that at all. So, uh, at, at closer inspection, people can now rely on the earrings or not. Um, but sometimes they wear their hair down over their ears, and then everybody's confused who's who. Um, they really struggle at school. Like people, uh, I mean, don't even make the effort to tell them apart. You know, they'll just yell both names one after the other, or. So that kind of wears on them a little bit um, yeah. where people just treat them as a single entity. Um, well, I mean, I know I did that in school, just not think, thinking about it. You know, the, the Pennington twins, mm-hmm. you know, I had class with the Pennington twins. I'm putting them together yeah. as a single entity. I yeah. didn't think that was a bad but thing. But then as a teenager, you want to be right. your own person. And yeah, yeah, I can see where that would, yeah, it kind of be a little hurtful for them. So, yeah. So are they, are they best friends? Uh, most days. Uh, most days. So I mean, they get along, a- they get along well most of the time, but they have their moments where it's not so much. And one, one is, um, uh, let's say more independent than her sister. And so she would love less time with her sister, more time doing her own thing, but her sister kind of is more dependent on her. Um, and so it's kind of this lopsided I guess, relationship in that regard. So like we, we homeschooled our kiddos up until maybe f- third grade. Um, so they went into school at third grade and, and one of our twins really, really needed her sister by her all the time to help her through that everything. And that, 
that that is still there to some extent, even though it's all these years later and they're in high school, but um, they get along pretty well. Um, is it the younger sister that needs the older sister's help or is it backwards? Uh, it, yeah, it turns out that way it is. Yeah, the younger sister wow. is the older. Wow. Did the school try and separate them, put them in different classes or did they let them be together? So we, uh, let's see, when we put them in, I think they were in separate classes, but the, they kind of rotated, like, you know, they have like a, a science teacher and like a math teacher and an English teacher, but they all have the same teachers. They just had different class times. Um, and then we switched schools and they were in the same class for a year. And then they went off to middle school and high school where sometimes they have the same classes together. Sometimes they don't. So it's been kind of a mix. Um, I think it's good when they have well, when they were young and they had the same teachers, so even though they were in separate classes, for a parent, it was easier, I thought, because um, I knew who the teachers were. I knew who what the homework assignments were. It wasn't like one set of homework for one kid and another set of homework for the same kid, a different kid. So it was easier, easier to keep track of. Um, and they can help each other with their assignments and stuff because they, they got the same information from the teacher. Um but now I, I also know that, like, well, it's it's good for them to be on their own and be independent and discover themselves, and so they're not always attached in uh, in their own eyes or other people's eyes to their to their twin. They're kind of forging their own path on their own. Yeah. yeah. So, do your twins have the matching name? Like I mentioned, Pennington's. It was Brandy, Brandy, and Bridget. Did you have the the matching names or the Joan and Jillian or? No, we we tried to stay far away from that as possible. Like, yeah, we were we were all about like individuality. Uh, so we just went up to the family tree looking for names that we liked, and there's no rhyme, there's no reason. They don't even share the same letters. It's like you know, um, because we we knew that they would be most likely be identical, and we wanted to try to give them some unique individuality, because. I mean, we we figured they'd probably struggle with that. And it turns out, you know, they have other people always grouping them together. So, yeah, no, no cutesy names. Um, yeah, us either. But I don't. I mean, so as late as we figured it out, we already had a name for a boy picked out, and um, so it was just picking out another name. And I, being matchy matchy with names, never even crossed my mind. We I were just, we were freaking out because we had the. the we had a party the following day. So yeah. we figured out the second name on the drive home. We did. I mean, we and we I, wanted to have that checked off the list. That was something that my wife could do. That yes. was something we can get a hold of right now. That's what I, that was one thing. I, that was like the only thing I can tr- could control <coughs> in that moment was figuring out a name for the second child. And so we, we did it. And um, yeah, so his, his second uh, kid's middle name is my uncle's name. Um, so we just passed because he doesn't have any kids of his own. So we, I, and he was my favorite uncle. So that's the only family in that. And then the older kid has the same initials as Wes's dad, but their names, I mean, it's Julian and Lex. They don't match at all. So, yeah. I think that's great. I mean, we wanted something where we could, like I say, yell across the house and there would be no confusion, which, which right. of the four, which of the four kids. So not just the twins, but the two boys too. Like, uh, so there weren't any similar sounds. Um, well, see, we didn't think of that. And no. Lex and Wes sound an awful lot alike when you're yelling it across the house. Yeah. That's annoying. <laughs> and it's so different. You wouldn't think about it until you right. yell it across the house. Yeah. Dude, yeah. what were you two and a half years ago? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that's important. That yelling across the house thing. Yeah. Golly. Well, oh, well. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's Too bad. Done. It's, 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 now. It's, it's the tone now. When you yeah. say it lovingly, you're calling you know, me. When, when you're, you're calling, yelling, you're yelling at the kids. You're funny. But when you're calling the kids, you you will be able to tell them. Yeah. The part. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's hard to envision them with any other name because they that's what they are, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Isn't that as weird? As, you, as soon as you get used to it, you're like, oh, we were considering these other names for you, but I'm like, why would we ever have called you that? That's so weird. That doesn't yeah. fit at all. It's yeah. weird because as parents, we just made it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. You right. we just pull it out of hat. Oh man. Yeah. So tell me, tell me something crazy that you've learned that you just never thought you'd find out on your uh, twin podcast that you have. 
Is there anything that's just shocked you or just like, wow, that is a great piece of information? Um, well, shocking. Um, well, I, I think one one thing that kind of a through a through line through all these interviews I've had with these twin dads is that um, they're putting their their family first. So the dad is putting the family first, and that can manifest itself in many ways. Like um, dads who uh, maybe had one kid before, and maybe mom did a disproportionate amount of work before. Dad's now fully engaged with with the twins and the family, or dad's deciding to be the stay at home dad while mom continues her career after maternity leave um, or uh, situations where they are making personal, you know, extreme personal sacrifices, you know, changing careers, moving, whatever it may be to, to be like, okay, I'm all in on, on making sure the family and the twins and my, and my partner are taken care of on this journey. I'd love that because um stereotypical historical dad is not that kind of involved engaged dad and so to see all these men stepping up and and being great dads and involved is is fantastic to me and i think uh, one of the twists of of fate with with twins is it kind of forces you to to be all in with them um i remember when our first two sons were born my wife was breastfeeding them I, and i'm like well there's not much i can do uh, well, the when the twins show up, it's like, oh yeah, okay, you can bring one twin to me while I feed the other. You're changing diapers, you're doing this. It's like you're you're all in engaged all the time. So that's been that's been great. I love seeing engaged dads, um, dads in traditional families, like dads, the single dads, divorced dads. I mean, all kind of dads, you know. So um, that's been fantastic to see, and they've overcome all manner of challenges. Like there's normal, normal pregnancy deliveries, like kind of we're describing in our two cases. And then there's like these extreme cases where you're like, you know, am I going to lose my, one of my babies or both my babies, or am I going to lose my, my partner, my wife, is she going to die in the operating table or, um, just insane nutso things where you're like, um, man, I'm, I'm glad that didn't happen to me, but I'm glad that your story turned out. Okay. You know, um, in the end, um, but I guess the, the, from talking to all these dads, it's like uh, they've all found a way to make it work. Like when we find out we're having twins, like you were just describing, you know, you're complete in freak out mode. You envision all the worst possible scenarios and then, it, you know, it works out. Now um, uh, we find a way to make it work and we, uh, our love expands to fill, to bring in both twins. We didn't think we can love our, our, our third kid as much as our first two. Now we love our third and fourth kid as much as our first, whatever, whatever the case may be. So um, it's just, it's just very encouraging. Every time I do podcast interviews, like with you or other dads, I'll go share something with my wife. I'm like, okay, well, this is way different than our experience. Um, it's, but it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, we brought our twins home and it shocked me, but I see what he's saying, but it just it didn't make sense. And, and unless you had twins, it wouldn't make sense to you. But my brother was like, just tell me, which which one do you like better? I mean, you have a favorite, right? Dude, you don't. You mm. really don't. And yeah. it's it's just the craziest thing, you know? I'll give one a hug and I'll just whisper in his ear, I love you so much. And then me, I have to go do the other one. I yeah. have to do it equal. And but the hugs are different because the kids taking the love or giving the love different, you know, one wants to tickle while you're doing it, but you know, it's, yeah, I love them so much. Yeah, man. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, I don't know. What, who do you think, uh, how, how do you, I'm a marketing guy. How do you try to get your podcast into someone? Like I found out I'm having twins five months in. I'm in shock. If I had had the Dad's Guide to Twins podcast that I could listen to in my private drive time to and from work, that might have really helped me out. And to let them know, it'll be okay. Somehow it finds a way to work out. Yeah, because you know, when, you, when it doesn't run in your family and you don't know people with twins, you feel like you are out in the world alone. You know that there's other people that have twins and they're okay and they've survived, but you don't know them personally. So you're like, how the heck am I going to do this? And once you have twins, you look around and you're like, oh, wow. Look at and people just come up to you and volunteer the information at that point, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but before that, you just, what, I don't know what I'm going to do. So, yeah, you feel like you're in a sea all alone in a storm and you don't know how to navigate it. 
So, so how can we get these dads right to your website, dadsguidetotwins.com? How can we do that? Besides being on my podcast, and I'll promote the heck out of it. What can we do? Yeah, I mean, I've got I've got the podcast. Uh, I've been doing that for like eleven years. So, and the uh, the website maybe fourteen years. Once I cleared that that fog of the first several months with the twins, I started doing the the website. And there's a YouTube channel too. So anywhere you're searching for dads of twins, father of twins, I'm going to pop up in the mix somewhere. Oh, so, that's awesome. That's awesome. I didn't know about the YouTube channel. I'm going to put that on there. Perfect. Um, a lot of, I'm interviewing a lot of dads now where they like stumbled on my podcast when they were having twins and now they're coming on my show and they've got two, three, four, five-year-old twins. So it's kind of fun to see the whole journey from like beginning to where they are full circle now, uh, paying it forward. Um like if, if someone listening to your podcast discovers they're having twins, uh, there's probably a local parents of multiples group in their city or nearby that they can physically go meet other parents of twins, uh, dads of twins. Uh, there are several Facebook groups uh, for like fathers of twins in the U.S., fathers of twins worldwide that are very engaged and active. You can ask whatever questions you want in there. I know there's an active um, uh, subreddit as well for uh, parents or multiples. So there, there's, there are online communities that people can tap into if there's nobody locally that they know. Um, but, and of course, uh, yeah, you check out my, my stuff. I'm happy to help too. Um, people have any questions. Well, I'm going to put all the links on my Facebook group. So West Aussie's Magic Life podcast, Facebook group. I'm going to have the YouTube channel, your podcast and the uh, .com on there. Dude, Thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, this this is awesome. awesome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And we got Natalie here. So you guys were able to, I felt, I felt like a weight off my shoulders that I could let her remember <laughs> the baby weights and things, man. That's the hard thing. Does other dads tell you that? Like they're afraid you're going to ask them questions that only mom would know. They are, they are. Or they'll be like, I mean, I just don't remember that first six months, first year. I, I don't remember oh. that. Yeah. <laughs> we made, we made it through. Fog. Yeah. All right. Well, it's dadguidetwin.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And um, only thing, one left thing to say for us. I'm tongue-tied. One more thing left to say for us. See, See you next you. week. Check us out online at wesisley.com and patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind-the-scenes videos, blooper videos, never-before-seen footage, discounts on merchandise, magic trick tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley, spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I. -S -S -E